Does watching TV count as learning English? Of course it does, but how do you do it? And which shows should you be watching? All right, mate, and welcome to the Brit Speak Pod, the podcast designed to help you understand British life, British culture, and of course, British English. So let's get cracking. Hey, up, mate, how's it going today? Yeah, I'm not too bad. Thanks for asking. And welcome to yet another episode of the Brit Speak Pod, where today we're talking all about the telly and how you can use it to improve your English. But before we get into all that, if you're new around here, nice to meet you. My name's Dan. Do me a favor. Please subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts from. I don't mind and I'd proper appreciate it. And if you're not new around here, welcome back, mate. I hope you had a good week and it's nice to see you again. Anyway, today we're talking about the telly, which is British English for TV. Now, that used to be a thing in the corner of the living room where you had four channels and you could choose to watch whatever they told you to watch at a specific time back in the olden days of the 1990s. However, things have moved on a bit since then. We've all got access to the internet which means we've all got access to things like Disney Plus or Netflix or BBC iPlayer or, you know, one of these hundreds and hundreds of streaming services that are out there. If you've got enough money, you can pay to use all of them. But if you're like me and you're poor, you can just use the password of your best mate who's actually subscribed to it and watch it for free. Whatever you do, you can actually get access to TV shows from all around the world, which means that you now have access to watching British TV shows, even if you're not in the UK. Buzzing! That means we can use them to improve our English. Sounds good, doesn't it? So, yeah, when I was learning Japanese, and I mean, still I'm learning Japanese, but I live in Japan, so I can turn the TV on Japanese TVs just there. You know, I can go through channels and just watch something in Japanese. I mean, don't get me wrong, Japanese TV is not my cup of tea. It's just famous people eating pudding and saying it's delicious. It's not that interesting. But when you get on things like Netflix or Amazon Prime Video, you get some pretty good stuff. And I used to use Netflix quite a lot to practice Japanese. Specifically, I used to use it for things like shadowing. I also used to use it for things like learning new vocabulary and context. And sometimes I just used it as a way to passively listen to Japanese while I were doing something else. All good things that you can do, right? So today, uh, it's kind of two parts. The first part is I want to talk to you a little bit about why, you you know, using TV is a good idea to supplement your study schedule, I guess. Like as part of your bigger study routine, TV can make up a part of it. And the other thing I want to talk to you about is some TV shows that I recommend if you're interested in British English, right? So there's kind of two parts. But let's dive into that first part, shall we? What are the benefits are watching TV if you're an English learner? Well, first of all, in my experience, I found that it's quite interesting to see the language you're learning be used in like real life situations. You know, if you're watching a drama show and the people are, you know, having a conversation, it's quite interesting that you can pick up and some new words and follow what they're saying. And oh, I recognize that grammar pattern from that textbook that I was reading kind of cool to see it working in real time and it's quite cool to get that genuine interaction how native speakers would actually use the language that you're learning i think that's quite interesting it sometimes shows you more like how and why we use certain words and phrases and expressions not just that they exist you know using them in the right way is kind of important and this is a good way to show you how to do that Another good thing that will happen if you spend a lot of time watching TV is you're going to pick up a lot of new words. There'll be words that come up over and over again that you didn't know. And, you know, it's a good idea to learn them words. If they keep cropping up and you don't know what they mean, go find a dictionary, write them down, learn them. And then next time you watch a TV show and it crops up, you'll be like, yes, I remember that word from last time. And it's good. And not only are you learning new words, you're learning words in context, which is a massive thing. Learning a new word on its own 
is really hard to remember it and how to use it. But if you're learning it in a context, in a full sentence, in a situation that you understand the story, that is how you should learn vocabulary. That's the most powerful way to actually learn new words is in a context that you understand. And TV is a fantastic way of doing that. So that's good. For me, the most important thing about TV as a learning material is that it's more interesting than textbooks. I'm an English teacher and I'm a Japanese student and I've got a lot of textbooks on my shelf, English ones and Japanese ones. But let's be honest, let's get down to brass tacks here. Textbooks are not the most interesting thing in the world. They're useful, don't get me wrong, they're good, but they're pretty boring. If you give me the option of like, Dan, would you like to do two pages of this Jam Japanese grammar book? Or would you like to watch One Piece for half an hour? I'm choosing One Piece, mate. I'm not, <laughs> not going to read a textbook if I don't have to. So yeah, it's always good to, you know, vary it up as well. I'm not saying that you shouldn't ever look at a textbook. What I'm saying is that sometimes watching a TV show is a bit more interesting, isn't it? And I always find, especially with me, if I'm interested in something, I'm much more likely to want to do it. So it's a good way of motivating myself to actually study sometimes. Not only that, you're going to learn the culture, not just the language, right? When you learn a language, you automatically kind of have to learn the culture that is goes hand in hand with it, right? You can't really avoid it. So TV will also give you an insight into life in that country, like if you're watching drama shows, for example, and it'll show you some of the culture and how the language is actually used by the people more than just the language that is being used, which is like a really big thing. So for me, those are kind of the benefits of watching TV as part of your study routine, right? But the question that everybody always asks is, should I use subtitles or not? Now, that is a tough question. And I don't think there's a solid answer one way or another. I have my thoughts and my feelings about it. And I'll try my best to explain why I feel the way I feel. But somebody else will probably disagree with me. Like, <laughs> you know, there's no one size fits all answer to this question. But I'm going to explain to you how it feels if I watch something with subtitles, right? Let's start with the, the worst case scenario. I'm watching a Japanese film, but I've got English subtitles, right? You know, I've got my own language subtitles and I'm listening to the audio in the language I'm learning. What do you think happens in that situation? I'm going to ask you a question. Do you think I spend more time listening to the audio or more time reading the text on the screen? Which do you think happens the most? Now, of course, you should have answered, we read the subtitles. It's just natural. When you've got the subtitles in your own language on the screen and the audio in another language, your brain can't concentrate on both of them at the same time. At least my brain can't. So I find that my brain doesn't even try and listen to the Japanese. It just reads the English subtitles. And what's the point in that? I can already read English. I don't need to practice reading English. I need to practice listening to Japanese. But my brain is like, nah, mate, I can see some English. We're going to concentrate on that. Like, thanks, brain. Really useful. I'm, I proper appreciate that. So, yeah, it's really hard to get your brain not to focus on your own language. So I strongly suggest not using subtitles in your own language. Now, the other side of this spectrum is when you have no subtitles, just audio. So I'm listening to something in Japanese with no subtitles, no English, no Japanese, no nothing, just the audio. And that is really, really hard. It's proper difficult to do that. And you're going to find that when you're starting out, you can't really understand what's going on. You'll pick up certain words and certain phrases and you'll follow kind of what's happening, but you don't really follow everything. And that's proper annoying. For me, I'm the kind of person where I'm like, I want to understand 100%. If I don't understand 100%, it feels like I understand 0%, which of course is absolute bollocks, but that's how I feel. And I feel like because I can't understand 100%, I can't do it. It's a waste of time. It's too hard for me. I can't do it. I give up. 
And that's also pretty stupid, isn't it? So I think if you're going to go down that route, you need to get very comfortable with the idea of you're not going to understand everything and you should focus on what you do understand, not what you don't understand. You know, if you can understand 25%, that's cool. Next time, let's aim for 26%. You know, you don't have to understand 100% for it to be a success, is what I'm trying to say. So yeah, that's how I feel when there's no subtitles. So the middle ground here then is to use the subtitles and the audio of the language that you're learning, right? For me, it'd be Japanese audio and Japanese subtitles. For you, it'd be English with English subs, right? And this is not terrible, but your brain is still going to read more than it listens. Just naturally, it, it's going to go that way. You're going to read the subtitles much more than you're going to listen to the audio. And that's not necessarily a bad thing if you're trying to practice your reading. If you want to improve your reading skills, that sounds pretty good. But if the point of all this is to improve your listening, which it probably is, the subtitles, even in the language you're learning, are probably going to hold you back a little bit, to be honest. So my advice is just jump in the deep end, go for no subtitles and just the audio, and become comfortable with not understanding everything. That's what I would suggest. If it's really too hard for you, like you really can't do it, why not try this? Watch it once with English subtitles and then watch it again without the subtitles. So you already have been exposed to it. You know roughly what's going to happen. The second time is just as a listening thing. That's probably a good approach if it's too hard. If not, just, you know, no subtitles. Go for it. What's the worst that could happen? If you don't understand very much, keep trying and you'll understand more next time, innit? That's basically how it works. So yeah, that's what I think about subtitles or no subtitles. Like I said, everybody's different. Somebody will probably argue with me, but for me, that's what I think. But when it comes to British TV shows, what are some TV shows that you should be watching? Because it's a big thing when you're learning English, you go to Google and you search TV shows to help me learn English. They're going to recommend friends. Like it's the most recommended thing in the world. And I'm not going to lie, I think Friends is proper boring. And if you're wanting to learn British English, Friends is about as useful as a chocolate fire guard. <laughs> Bit of a weird British reference, but a chocolate teapot. You know, a chocolate teapot is not going to be very much use, is it? Because you'll put hot water in it to make the tea and it's going to melt. Therefore, it's useless. And that's what Friends is if you want to learn British English. I'm not saying don't watch Friends. What I'm saying is that if you want to understand British English... You're going to need to watch something a little bit more British. And I've got some recommendations for you. Of course I have. I'm a nice guy. So I'm going to recommend maybe five or six TV shows that I think will be worth a watch if you're learning British English. Now, number one on my list is a TV show called Taskmaster, which has just started a new season. Uh, I think it's probably like season 16, I think, at this point. There's loads of them. Uh, and Taskmaster, let me try and explain what it is in a nutshell. Basically, five contestants compete in a series, right? And each series has got maybe 10 episodes. And in each episode, they have to do like weird challenges that the Taskmaster presents to them. And so the Taskmaster is a guy called Greg Davies, and he makes these little challenges that they need to do. And they get points depending on how well they do. And at the end of the season, whoever's got the most points wins, right? Uh, so there's Greg, he's the taskmaster, and his assistant is little Alex Horn, uh, who's like just his assistant who makes a lot of the challenges up. And yeah, five contestants every season. It changes every season. There's five different contestants. And it's really funny. It's a really, really funny show. An example of a task that you might see on Taskmaster is eat the most watermelon possible in one minute, you know, and that's the rules. And people have these weird approaches where they'll, you know, some people try it with a spoon and other people just use their hands. And it's kind of funny. It's quite physical humor. You know, it's, it's not serious. And even if you don't speak English, I'm sure you'll find it quite funny watching famous people struggle to do these basic tasks. So I highly recommend it. It's very funny. I love it. My wife loves it as well. She's a Portuguese speaker, but she loves it. Um, and we're watching the new season as soon as it comes out. So it's pretty good. 
another good thing about Taskmaster is there's always a lot of different accents on there. You know, like five different uh, guests, celebrities, and the Taskmaster and the Taskmaster assistant are a bunch of different accents. So it's really good for practice. Yeah, check it out. Really good. Taskmaster. I'm pretty sure you can watch it on YouTube. So check it out. And next, we've got a series called Black Mirror, which is on Netflix, I think. Now, Black Mirror is weird. It's like a dark drama. And each episode is totally different. Like each episode is like a mini film. And it deals with all kinds of different social aspects and things. Like in the latest season, there's um, like a murder mystery kind of thing. There's also like a two people in space kind of thing. And there's one episode that's based in the 70s about a woman that has to kill three people in 24 hours or something like this. There's a lot of random stuff, but each episode is really thrilling and kind of funny, but dark humor. Uh, it's, it's really, really, really good. Really well done. But it is a bit dark. Like if you're looking for sunshine and rainbows, this is not for you. But if you want like the idea of the British Prime Minister being blackmailed into having sex with a pig on live TV, maybe this is for you. <laughs> that is legit one of the plots of the first episode. And as you can see, it's quite a strange TV show, but it's worth a watch. And you'll get a lot of interesting new words. And there's a lot of ideas that you won't see in other TV shows. So it's definitely a bit of a dark horse, so to speak. Uh, so it might be worth checking out. Another TV show I always recommend to students is called Gogglebox. Gogglebox, by the way, is really old slang for TV. Because you would put your goggles, which is another way of saying like eyes, at the TV at the box. So Gogglebox, it's a TV. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Gogglebox is a TV show that started in the UK, but it's actually available in loads of different countries now. And the idea is, is that they film regular, normal people. And those normal people are just watching TV and they're reacting to it. They're talking to each other about what's happening on the screen. And I know it sounds weird because it's a TV show watching people watching TV. You know, it's kind of weird. But honestly, if you watch it once, it's kind of addictive. So I think you'll proper enjoy it. And it's really good because it doesn't just show like the quintessential British person, you know shows all different kinds of British people from all different backgrounds. You've got poor people, rich people, posh people, immigrants, you know, working class, CEOs, everybody all watching TV at home and talking about it. And it's really funny. It has loads of different accents. Uh, it's a really good idea to get used to all the different British accents. And it's really funny as well. Some of the characters that keep coming back are just proper funny. And you'll also get used to the British psyche the way that british people think about things so yeah goggle box there's loads of seasons of that as well worth a watch up next i'm a big fan of comedy and there's a sitcom from probably 2010 somewhere around then it's called it crowd and it's about two like it engineers two geeks that work in some big office right and their new supervisor is not good with computers and they have these weird situations it's a typical british sitcom but it is really funny and the reason i like sitcoms is that they're quite beginner friendly the plot is not very difficult to follow you know it's not some cerebral crime solving drama it's just a sitcom situational comedy that means by the way a lot of the accents in it are similar to like an rp accent you know, so you're probably going to have an easy time understanding it. And it's funny. What more could you want in life? So that's IT Crowd. Speaking of cerebral, rhyme-solving kind of stuff, Sherlock is another popular one that was on the BBC. Uh, you know, the story of Sherlock Holmes, right? Uh, Dr. Watson, he shares a flat with Sherlock Holmes, who's a bit mental, and he can solve crimes, and together they go and solve some crimes together. Really famous story. You know, Sherlock Holmes is proper famous. And this one had got like Benedict Cumberbatch playing Sherlock Holmes, right? So quite famous actor as well. The stories are put together really well as a BBC show. Usually you get some good production as well. 
Um, loads of interesting vocabulary. The accents are not too difficult. You know, that quintessential posh British accent is very common. But yeah, if you like that kind of thing, uh, Sherlock is pretty good. Uh, if you really want to go one step further and the really famous British stuff, Doctor Who is a famous one. I'm not really a fan of Doctor Who myself. But if you're into your sci-fi stuff, it's about a time-traveling doctor and it's been on British TV for 50 years uh, with different main actors playing the main character, Doctor Who. You know, uh, it's, if you're into that kind of thing, it's worth watching. It's not really my cup of tea, but loads of people like it, especially if you're into sci-fi. Um, yeah, Doctor Who. Anyway, another one that quite a few of my students have asked me about recently, and I'm going to be honest, I've not actually seen it. It's on my list of things to watch that I'll eventually get around to watching, but it's called Peaky Blinders. And Peaky Blinders is basically like a, a British mafia kind of TV show. And it's set in like the early 1900s in England. And it's like a gang uh, who commit crimes, right? I think like a mafia kind of gangster TV show, but in, in England. And it's called Peaky Blinders. And the main guy is called like Tommy Shelby. And it just kind of shows his, his story, the boss of this crime gang. It's proper popular at the minute. And the episodes are pretty interesting. I think it's about six seasons. Uh, one thing that people might struggle with is the accent because um, it focuses on like, there's a, a mainly an Irish character and then there's the Birmingham accent. So those accents are not easy to understand at first. So it might be difficult, but yeah, I've heard it's really good. It's like the British Breaking Bad is what people say. So yeah, it might be worth a look. And so that's what I recommend for TV shows, but that's what I'd recommend to anyone. But I want to tell you what I love when it comes to TV. This is like a bonus recommendation. In the 1990s, late 80s, early 90s, the BBC in the UK had like a golden era of situational comedy, sitcoms. And there was quite a lot of really good shows that happened at the same time. And if you're into like comedy, these are what I would suggest above all else. They might be a little more tricky to find, but check it out. So first of all, my favorite TV show of all time is called Bottom. It features two characters, Richie and Eddie. They live in London and they're losers and they have these stupid ideas in their life. And it's really funny. Father Ted is a sitcom in Ireland about some priests that live on a deserted island and they have these little adventures. It's kind of funny. Red Dwarf. Red Dwarf is the idea is it's like an outer space sitcom where there's four people trapped on a spaceship in the middle of space. It's kind of funny. Black Adder. Black Adder features uh, Rowan Atkinson, who was Mr. Bean. You know, the guy that plays Mr. Bean. Before that, he did a show called Blackadder, where in different historical periods in the UK, like each season is a different period in the UK history, right? Um, for example, there's one season where it's like World War II. There's another season where it's like the Elizabethan period and, you know, all the different points of UK history. There's a different season. Really funny, really, really funny uh, show. And last, Only Fools and Horses. Now, if you ever speak to Stu Sensei, he loves Only Fools and Horses. And it features the story of uh, Rodney and Del Boy, and they're trying to get rich. Uh, you know, two proper cockneys trying to earn a quick book and get rich. Really funny, classic British comedies. All of them are amazing. Try and check them out. Uh, I highly recommend it. But yeah, that's what I think. Let me know what you think. What TV shows do you enjoy watching? Let me know if you're, lost, if you're listening to this on Spotify. Other than that, subscribe to this podcast. That's britspeak.co forward slash britspeakpod. Cheers for listening today. That's it though. And I'll catch you in the next one. See you.